Hello, and welcome to The Potential State. My name is Dr. Sel Romanelli, and today we're going to be talking about covert male depression. This episode is actually taken from a recording of a webinar I gave to therapists a couple weeks ago. So I apologize for the sound quality, which isn't as sharp as usual, but I really wanted this content out. I think this is super important. The webinar begins with my own personal story dealing with my covert male depression, and it continues on to detail Terry Reel's a beautiful and touching conceptualization of men and the covert male depression that they experience. I then continue with my own interpretations and my, the way I work with men on these topics, and I think this is a super important topic that both men and women should know. So I hope you enjoy it, and let's go. So what you see there, that's Joe Romanelli, my dad, and that's me when I was about four or five. And I'm going to start this talk with talking about myself and my own covert depression and how I met it and how I'm dealing with it, actually, since... So this guy over here, he's probably my age now. I mean, he was probably 40 when that picture was taken. I'm 43 now. He, he, Joe was born to, uh, he had Italian immigrants. Romanelli is our last name. They ran away before the war from Venice and he grew up in Brooklyn with a father that was actually, they had an Italian restaurant and he would be working 14, 15, 16 hour days. So in fact, he grew up without a uh, present father who was actually part of that of the family life and most of his life was the restaurant. And when I was born, um, my dad obviously improved on that script, but my dad, whoever knows him, he's a very extroverted on stage, but in, at home he's very introvert and he's very quiet. And he wasn't very um, emotionally expressive at home. And I will tell you how all this connects later in the talk. So I grew up in French Hill the conservative movement of the 80s, the bubble, the Anglo-Saxon bubble in Jerusalem. Um, I and mean, I grew up more or less as a normal kid in the sense that I wasn't really excelling in any other any of the fields, but I was always um, very pleasing. I was a pleaser. I was a good kid. I had good grades, never got into trouble, never rebelled, and kind of went through life doing all the right things, getting good grades in high school, being an elite unit in the army, doing my undergrad, and then I actually replicated my dad's profession. He was a shaliach for the Jewish agency, and I became a shaliach for the Jewish agency. And on the way, I even replicated my mom's profession, who's a social worker. So I became a social worker as well. And I'm doing all this, and I'm performing, and I'm flying high. Um, I decided to get married. I, I, I have a kid, and then I decide I want to do a PhD, and I want to bring my two biggest passions, which is improv and therapy, together. And I spent six years researching it as I'm performing. Another kid's born on the way. And I hit the big four zero, the big 40. And boom, there it is. I get the PhD. And then I have another month in me. And then I collapse. I kind of realize what's the point of all this. I kind of lose interest in teaching what I was researching. Um, my energy dropped, my efficiency dropped, and something weird was happening to me. And I was like, what's happening right now? Why don't I have the zest and the passion and the, and the, and the push? Because my, my idea, my dream was to conquer the world now that I finished and I proved in my PhD that improv for therapists works. And I was like, why don't I want to publish this? Why don't I want to write a book? Why am I not teaching this in every single university in Israel? And I start sinking into what I was recognizing as my midlife crisis. Um, on the right, I did what most men do. I signed up for a marathon. By the way, the most, uh, the peak of men doing marathons are 39 and 49. So I was right on the statistic. I run a marathon, I actually run two marathons thinking that's what I needed. And then I realized that wasn't really it either. I was kind of, I was, something in me was just kind of turned off. Um, and that took a couple of months until I happened to stumble on the book that Shalom Atlas was talking about called I Don't Want to Talk About It, Overcoming the Secret Legacy of Male Depression. Now, what's interesting about this book is it was on my bookshelf for years. In fact, for the past 20 years, I've only read um, psychotherapy, improv, communication, and that kind of, I've only read that genre. And that book has been on my shelf for years, but something about I just, I couldn't, I didn't want to reach it. I didn't look at it. Um, and then after that second marathon, I decided, well, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pick it up and read it. And it really rocked me. It rocked me really hard at the time. 
I was already a couple therapist. I was married, I had two kids, but it was the first time that I read anything about this, that I discussed this with any with anyone. I mean, in my mind, I was discussing with Terry Real. And in fact, this was the only book I've ever finished and started rereading it right just immediately. It was so clear to me that what is written in this book, I need to download and get into the muscle. And that book really shifted the way I, I saw myself. It gave me a lot of language to what I was experiencing. And it really, I wouldn't say revolutionized the way I work with men, but it certainly shed a whole different light because I work a lot as a couple therapists, 50% of my clients are men. And I also do individual therapy. So I also see men. And, and as family therapy, what I do these days, I do family therapy with adult children. So in fact, um, kids in their 20s and 30s working with their, their parents. Um, by the way, open parentheses, a, a year ago, we left Jerusalem to move to Kfasaba. And as I was transitioning, I started doing family therapy with Joe Romanelli and my mom and Achinam. And I've been slowly doing family therapy every other week for a year now. So all of this work has become very personal for me and has spilled over to, the way, uh, to my professional work. I want to say one more thing about, because I know everyone here is almost therapists. Um, it took me many years to accept the fact that I am a male therapist. And instead of belittling it or putting it to the side or bracketing it to actually use that and to put it on the table. And that's part of improv and therapy, right? How do we say the thing? How do we put that on the, on the table and use that? Um, so I want to say that my use of the covert male depression as a man is... It, it will be different than a female therapist working with these ideas. And please write down all your questions and there's going to be ample time to kind of wrestle with this together. So he writes this book, um, Terrence Real. He was actually here about two years ago with his wife, Belinda. He wrote three books. This was the first one. And the other one was called, How Can I Get Through to You? And the third one was The New Rules for Marriage. So he's basically, his, his school of couples therapy is called the Relational, school, uh, Relational Life School. He has a whole website. He does tons of online courses. But this book is basically sharing his story. He was the son of, a, of an abusive father, and he combines that with research. In fact, this was the first book ever written about male depression. And it, I see this as a masterpiece. And just like Shalom Atla said, I have two copies of it in English, two copies of it in Hebrew, and I keep lending it out. I never have them in my, in my library because they're always lent to, uh, to men to read, actually, sometimes to women as well. So, so how do we raise our boys? Um, and I, you can see a picture here of Tzach. He's my eldest. He's now nine and a half. This is Tzach on the left side. When he was um, about three or four, you can see he's wearing earrings. He's playful. And then two or th once he started first grade, we just saw this shift into kind of boy, man, boy, boy mentality, boy psychology. He doesn't wear pink anymore. He doesn't talk to girls anymore. He doesn't dress up, doesn't put on earrings. Obviously he wants to be a soldier. And, and basically, you know, what research shows is that both boys and girls are born with the same potential for feelings. But the material has this concept of psychological patriarchy. Psychological patriarchy is when we separate the male and the female elements and we position the male above the female. Okay, so the masculine energy is assertive, aggressiveness, power, dominance, and feminine of feeling, connection, vulnerability. Split them and we put them like that. And basically what happens is we're castrating our boys. And we're saying, this is good, this is, is this devalued. So assertiveness, be strong, be a give you, be a man, stand up straight, stop crying. Or I hear crying is not efficient. I hear this all the time. Why are you crying? It's not going to help you. Okay? While minimizing the emotional expressivity. And then another big concept that Terriel talks about is the loss of the relational. The child needs to give up his relationship with his mom, with his sensitive side. With his female friends, Tzach has no playdates anymore with girls. Although when he was in kindergarten, he had tons of girlfriends. And now that's just stopped completely. And mocking femininity leads to an aversion of expression of vulnerability. And over time, that actually leads men to have less of an emotional vocabulary. We all know this. But I think having it in like the timeline so we can see this progress. And I think as I'm seeing this happen in front of Tzach, in front of my eyes, I mean, my wife, by the way, Galit, She's a PhD candidate in gender, and she talks about, she works a lot with moms and about breastfeeding shame. And we're a very gender-aware family, and we're trying to hold, to keep Tzach a little bit more sensitive and playful. And we, we, he has a one, one doll in his bed 
from all the dolls he used to have. And we talk to her, we try to help him keep a little bit of that relational. When he comes into bed, we try to give him that time before, we try to soften the psychological patriarchy that is being, you know, that he's sucking in from school, from YouTube, from his friends, from culture. So that's uh, on one leg, how we raise boys. And where does that lead us to? Okay, um, I'm, I'm not seeing you guys, I've just seen a slideshow. So if you have a question, open up your mic. That'd be the easiest way, because if not, I, I'm not seeing all your faces. I only have one screen. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to move forward. I'm assuming that's yes. Okay. So Nelson Mandela, a boy may cry, a man conceals his pain. So this picture is in Chicago. Um, this is my bar mitzvah. We're holding up Atalis's bag. And he has this wonderful idea of, of, of active trauma versus passive trauma, okay? So we talk about trauma. And so active trauma is abuse, right? Whether it's abuse, um, rape, abuse, violence, intrusion, right? And we all know that and people can report that, but we don't really report is the passive trauma, is neglect, apathy, coldness, a distance, okay? And, and it, it, took, it took me a while in my own therapy as well, in my family therapy, to realize that part of what I was feeling was passive trauma. My parents trying to survive, trying to just take care of themselves, holding the family together amongst many, many differences and many challenges that they were experiencing. So there was a sense of I was kind of alone in this bubble. But if you look at it, a lot of these men, there's no, in their biography, there's nothing clear about abuse. But this idea of passive trauma for not a lot of men opens up something to realize they were not seen, they were not celebrated, they're not cared for, they weren't touched. Okay, the fact that no one celebrated, no one said a good word to you, that's just as traumatic as someone hitting you. But for many men, they're like, well, nothing happens to me, nothing needs to happen for you to feel these feelings. And then, and then there's this initiation, whether it's the bar mitzvah or nothing, where you become a man and there's an expectation that you are not a boy anymore, you need to stand up. And then what happens is, Tatiria talks about the development of three children, inner children. So there's the wounded child, the child that was suffering from the passive trauma, okay, of not being seen, not being celebrated, or the active trauma. So in order to protect that wounded child, just, we, we develop two, two children inside of us. There's the harsh child, the aggressive one that inflicts pain on other, that yells at other, yells at his wife or at his kids or his coworkers. Okay, and there's the adaptive child. The adaptive child, and this is really crucial for working with men, is that part of themselves that they've developed to protect the wounded child. Okay, so in my case, my adaptive child was the pleaser. I was nice, I was always sweet, I was always sensitive. You know, I didn't really cry a lot, didn't demand a lot of attention, I was whatever they wanted. And that adaptive child has been with me all these years. I'm going back to Danny. Danny protected himself, by the way, from a mom that was very narcissistic, did not see him by becoming the charmer, by womanizing, by wowing people. So that adaptive child brings the, the kind of leads the man in the front and is basically his shield. And for many, many years, this adaptive child would actually be his facade, his business card into the world. And with that adaptive child protecting the wounded child, protecting that trauma, the boy starts running. And the metaphor that Terry talks about is imagine there's a fire, there's a forest fire with my dad's pain, my grandfather's pain, you know, my family's pain, and I'm running away from it. I'm, I don't want to look around. I don't want to stop because if I stop, it's going to consume me. So I run away from that trauma. And where do I run for? So when we think about depression, depression is usually for women. Depression is a feminine phenomenon that is underdiagnosed with men and overdiagnosed with women. And what he really talks about, which is really fascinating, there's different symptoms for depression in men and in women. So whether with, with women, we'll see it more as crying and, 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 and anguish and sleeping a lot and all the more ex, like externalized symptoms. With men, we will actually see it differently. We'll see it in, some of them will express it in over depression, whether it's anhedonia, suicidal tendency, excessive crying, despair, sleep disorders and whatever, but a lot of them will, will develop what's called a covert depression. And let's talk about that. Covert male depression. So as an attempt to avoid being overwhelmed with guilt and shame and pain, we narrow ourselves. And here's a concept I use all the time with my clients. It's called four to sixers. 
So imagine the emotional range is from one to 10. One is deep despair and 10 is ecstasy, okay? Our ch as children, we, we experience the whole range. We can move from one to 10 within two minutes. Look at you, that your children or your grandchildren, they have all the emotional range. But over time, society or psychological patriarchy or whatever you want to call it, limits us. And a lot of men, especially when we're in this covert depression, we're a four to sixers, okay? Which basically means we don't feel too much to this side and we don't feel too much to that side. We're kind of in the middle. And that you can see through apathy, numbness, concreteness, lack of play, boredom, cynicism. Okay, cynicism, by the way, is a form of play, but it's actually being passive aggressive. I'm you know, playful, but actually I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm bored. Um, by the way, I just want to say, open parentheses, I have a YouTube channel that I run with my wife with over 125 videos, each one of them about eight minutes on several of these concepts. So I will be sending a handout summary, but if any of these topics interest you, email me and I will send you the links to the specific videos. Like for instance, there's a video about cynicism, the joke's always on you, showing the defense mechanism behind cynicism and how can people step out of that. Close parentheses. So these four to sixers, this covert depression. So we numb ourselves on one hand and we run through addiction out. Work, money, sex, porn, alcohol, drugs. Actually the most popular uh, addiction which we underdiagnose when we work with men is work. Okay, the workaholics. The people that have very high efficiency, very high output, very successful. Okay, but no one's stopping them because they get more, the more they work, the more they succeed, the more they get applause, right? And then the and the traditional gender roles, the more money he I mean, his job is to go outside and make money. So he's he can actually spend his whole life at work. And I'm thinking about my grandfather, who basically worked 16 hour days in the restaurant. He came home, he'd fall asleep in front of the TV, wake up, go to work. That was you know that was his presence at home. So in that sense, he was always at work. Now, again, it's a different type, socioeconomic levels and such. But if you think about that, for many, many men, our covert depression express ourselves with just diving into work. And if I'm going back to my story, I was literally just working 24-7. I was teaching. I was performing. I was doing therapy. I was researching. I did not stop for a decade. And I think part of what happened to me when I hit the covert, when I actually hit the over depression, which we'll talk about in a second, it all stopped. I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to do it anymore. But being efficient all these years and having very high, a very high output, it was misleading because people thought, oh my God, he's so successful. He's so happy because he's doing so many things. But looking back, I realized I was actually running away from feeling my own pain or and feeling my dad's pain, my, my grandfather's pain. And that was kind of a run. And then the last thing I want to say, and then I do want to pause for questions because I think this is important. I want you guys to kind of wrestle with this a little bit. He talks about this and go in two different ways. The grandiosity, uh, to be like ah, full of themselves and just steamrolling other people or dissociation, just completely numbing themselves down. And I wrote Faulty Father um, because I see this all the time. There's a Facebook group called Abba Pagum, Faulty Father. They have a sticker. It's a bumper sticker. And there's a quarter of a million men there. And the common denominator of that group is how <laughs> they're faulty fathers, right? They, they, like a joke could be like, I dropped my daughter off at the, at the wrong kindergarten. He, 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 all right? So they're celebrating their numbness and their kind of lack of connection with their own children. And then the way they call their wives in every post is the righteous one, Hatsodeke, okay? okay? So there's this, this split. There's the righteous woman who's right, parentheses, and bitter. And there's the faulty father who's happy, but has like, eh. we say in Hebrew, en sechel, en no brain, no worries. And it's become almost, almost like a status symbol. Like I see this all the time in the clinic, right? The father that doesn't remember anything about anything connected to the home. And the mom who, who just wants more intimacy and just wants more connection and why you're not home earlier. And this unfortunately has become almost like a, a stigma, a baseline, a stereotype of what's happening in a lot of um, heterosexual relationships in Israel and the world. And in fact, when I come in with these ideas, a lot of men and women will be like, what's the problem? That's just normal because that's all they see around themselves. So I want to pause here for a second, questions, pushback, clarifications before I kind of move forward.
to mention, um, this is Tanya speaking, um, as a trauma therapist, a lot of what you're describing is screaming trauma to me and attachment trauma. Um, so I just wanted to, to note that. Thank you. And I think, I think what's, what's interesting about that is that most men will not come because of this. <laughs> They're coming because their wife is angry at them because whatever, they had an affair or she had an affair. Very few of them will come and say, hi, you know, I'm feeling this emptiness inside of me. I feel like I'm running away from my own pain. Can you help me with that? I mean, about 0% of men come to me for that. But what will happen is we unearth this relatively soon. And then again, and I'm going to give some case studies here. Not all of them want to do this work. And the reason I chose this picture from the army, because I think that's a classic, classic um, socialization tool in Israel where you need to suck up. And I remember I was in an elite unit, elite infantry unit here, and we could never sing, certainly not cry. We could never sit and rest. We, can't, we couldn't complain that it was hard for us. Okay, that, would, that was considered not manly. So they were basically pushing us into being the stoic four to six machines. Now, okay, it's the army. So there's also a brainwashing element because you're trying to transition to being a soldier. But if you think about Israeli society, you know, a lot of men go through that machine, come out on the other side. So it's about unlearning things they were taught um, or drilled into in the army. Any other thoughts or comments before I move forward to I, I have one. Study? Linda, I have one. You might have just like answered it in your last comment, but um, do you find this more in like heterosexual relationships or um, are gay men also? in your experience just as affected or differently affected? How do you have, what's your experience? So thank you for that question, Linda, because I was, I'm working now, I'm working now with a couple. I mean, he's Jewish Israeli and he's Arab, European Arab, Christian Arab. And what was really interesting for them, even though the Christian Arab one from Europe did not have the army experience, they were both expressing some sort of boredom, like very similar kind of, covert depression um, vibes. So it, it's been my, from my experience, I mean, I don't work a lot with LGBTQ, but I have noticed that these patterns, these, these patterns are kind of universal because whether you're, you're straight or you're gay, you've still gone through the psychological patriarchy. It gets all of us in the way. And as maybe much as you want to fight maybe, it. Maybe it's even worse if you're gay because it's also that baggage of depression. Right, from, right. And you're also trying to hide it. they've gotten from society. Or they try to overcompensate by being extra buff, extra strong, extra muscular. And, and that sends us even, even deeper into that. Any, any other questions or comments before I move on? Okay, let's go. So this is what I've noticed, the core beliefs. Core beliefs as we, I'm just gonna, if I'm saying a concept that is not familiar for you, please let me know. If not, I'm assuming we all more or less work with core beliefs. Core belief is a, it's such a core belief that I cannot disprove it. Or it's a scheme, I mean, something called schema, scheme, a scheme, right? So the core belief, the, the tricky thing about it is you cannot disprove them. And he who holds a hammer, the whole world is a nail. So there's core beliefs, and you know, we work with in NLP and in coaching and in CBT and a lot of different modalities, but these are the core beliefs that I've noticed that I, I see a, that are kind of giving me the hints that I'm working with someone who's kind of in this covert depression state. I call the combination of this Igor's because it's an either or. I call it Igor's like Igor, like, like this monster that kind of chows down and kind of limits this the man's mental state, psychological state, and obviously his relationship. So it's a combination of the psychological patriarchy and covert depression leads to several of these dichotomous core beliefs. And by the way, um, I have you can't see this, but I have a whiteboard in my clinic and oftentimes I will write these core beliefs on the board as they're saying it, just as to show them and their partner, obviously, what's kind of, what's the operating system they're working with. So the first one I see all the time is feelings are not useful or they're feminine or they're dangerous or they're a burden. I see this all the time. Feelings are a burden. I don't want to burden my wife. I don't want to burden my kids. Why? Because there's this core belief that your pain equals my responsibility or my fault or my job. So every time somebody shares with them the pain, they have to do something about it. Deborah Tannen calls this report talk. So, so any pain is something I need to do with, and I need to do with, so that why over time, I don't want to share my pain because I don't want to burden you. You worked so hard with the kids all day. Well, I'm going to share with you. I had a shitty day at work. No, I don't want to burden you. But that what happens is they don't share it. 
because they don't want to seem like pathetic or needy or clingy or they want to burden because their job is to suck it up. I had a man here just the other day, a Chabad Orthodox man saying, I have a tooth pain for the past half a year. I didn't want to tell my wife, I don't want to burden her. So if he's not talking about his toothache for a half a year, he's certainly not going to talk about other feelings he's feeling, okay? And obviously there's either you're a winner or a loser. Losers don't cry, you know, I mean, losers are, are whine. Don't, I don't want to whine, I want to be a winner. And then there's also this, it's either your pain or my pain. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to overshadow your pain. If I start your pain, that means I'm not sensitive to you. And then they, they're left with what's called either the, their bunker or they explode. And limiting this emotional range leaves us with basically two avenues for men, either aggressiveness and sexuality. Those are the only two places where we can you know, break out of the four to six. That's what's left when we are cast after all the psychological castration. So what we're seeing is we're either seeing the apathetic faulty father who's basically numbing and blinding himself, you know, taking him, blinding himself to his wife's contempt and boredom and anger, you know, stores it all in until he explodes. And oftentimes, another thing you can see over depression will be the man, I call this the mommy son dance. So you'll see the single married mom next to the fifth or sixth child. He will become kind of like a child in the relationship. And needs to, she needs to remind him constantly and nag him all the time. And from there, we know the pursuer distance or dance. And oftentimes, and I'll talk to these men and they'll be like, whatever, I don't care. It doesn't touch me. She can say whatever she wants. Da, 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 da. He, he basically blinds himself because he doesn't want to see this. Because if he will open his eyes, the two things he will immediately see is one is his wife's contempt and pain beyond her nagging. And he will have to meet his own pain, which he does not want to meet. He doesn't even know he has. And he's scared of even approaching that. Okay, any questions? Yes, no, okay. I'm gonna keep going. So how do you treat over depression? I think that's the question. And, and uh, you start obviously with connecting to oneself. And one of the best quotes I love from him, he said, Terry Real says, the only cure for covert depression is overt depression. You cannot run away from this. You have to stop running, turn around to the flames and let it consume you. And the three stages that he talks about is sobriety. I'm going to dive into each one of these. Relational maturity and then trauma release. Now, you know, he has his own method. Um, I, I'm not a very real therapist. I'm inspired by him. But I'm going to give you a little bit of how I understand those three phases. So sobriety. As I said, the cure for covert depression is over depression. I'm choosing this picture from when I was a shaliach in London, I used to fly, you know, with EasyJet all over Europe, but I was flying high. And I was really, I was just literally working 18 hour days, performing at night, not really having any time alone. I was single, I was lonely. I was probably depressed, but I was way too busy milking the European experience. So the first thing you need to do is help the man stop running to stop addictive behaviors. Um, for this one man, he smokes pot every night and he masturbates twice a day. So the first thing we need to talk about is he needs to cut down both of those behaviors. And why is he doing that? Because he's numbing himself, because he doesn't want to meet himself, because he doesn't want to meet his wife. So the first phase is to show this and help them stop that. And the, the example I always give them, I tell them, allow yourself to collapse. It is a collapse. It is not fun. It is not a joyful experience. That is exactly what happened to me. After the PhD, I just dropped. And I think for me, I didn't know how to even understand what was happening for me because I was, I was flying high for so many years. I was working so hard in so many jobs. And I thought something was wrong with me. Like, why don't I have the energy? So the first step for men is to try to help them stop. I'm going back to Danny, the serial adulterer, and he did not want to stop. He was not ready for that. I explained these concepts from, I was trying to show him and he, he wouldn't have any of it. And by the way, he left. And then a couple of months later, he sent me a line. He said, I'm still with that other woman, but I'm doing good work. But he's not willing to let go of that addiction. He's not willing to stop running. And I think what I've noticed is, and because I am a man and kind of went through some of this, is that I can share from my personal experience. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. 
But what I've noticed is by speaking to men about a similar experience that happened to me, I feel like it kind of normalizes that, especially if the men are very successful. I think what, what's harder for the covert, it's harder to work with a covertly depressed man who's highly successful at work because his environment is actually applauding him. And no one in his society and environment is saying, stop, slow down. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't take that extra gig. Don't take that extra job. And I just, uh, anecdote, I always say when I wanted to do a PhD. Um, so my wife, Galit said, I love it, but I don't want to drop in the quality of our life. Her message was basically, Sababa, do it, but I want to keep the same income. Now, she didn't say it from a mean place, but that is psychological patriarchy, right? You can do whatever you want on the side, but keep providing. Keep being that steady provider, okay? And that message, that double bind that a lot of men are experiencing, that's part of our challenge. The second phase is relational maturity. And this picture, actually, um, our daughter Lila took. I was fighting with Gil. We had a big fight. And that was our way of trying to um, connect and to make up. We didn't even know that she took that picture, but that's that's as real as I can get to a moment of relational maturity. Basically, what it is is to teach them the skills. Teach men the skills of how to be in relationships, how to be relational. So it's obviously a muscle that they need to practice, help them step down from grandiose or come up from shame, feel comfortable through verbalizing feelings instead of acting them out. This is really important because oftentimes men don't even know what they're feeling. So I had a period where I had that smiley chart and I'd say to him, what are you feeling right now? But what I do these days more often, I will just do a double. I will say, are you feeling angry or are you feeling sad right now? It feels like you're actually feeling frustrated. And by helping them say the thing, and then probably say, say the thing, say what's happening right now, saying the feelings. But the first thing we need to soften is that core belief that feelings are a burden. So we have to soften them from thinking that if they say it or not, they're upset, their wife's going to be working overtime to please them. In fact, we're helping the couple cut that umbilical cord so each one can share their feelings. But the second phase is to help them share what they are actually feeling. And I think that is a lesson I'm learning because I didn't, it wasn't really modeled to me. And I, I'm trying to consciously share with my kids what is happening with me, whether it's good or bad. I want to give two quick examples. So we moved to Falsaba. We actually just moved to this apartment. And it's, it's a disaster. I mean, we're in a construction zone. It's not done yet. And the last two weeks ago, it was a brutal week and I had nothing else to give. I was exhausted and angry and frustrated. And I just remember coming to Tzach at bedtime and I say, Tzach, I have nothing to give right now. I'm exhausted. I'm feeling helpless. And just sharing those feelings, instead of just acting them out, which obviously I was cranky and I was yelling and, you know, but to help to share that. But the other thing I needed to learn how to share is to share the good moments. When I'm having a happy moment, having a seven or an eight out of 10 moment, to also say that to the kids. And as we were making chocolate balls this last Friday, as my parents were about to come visit, there was just a happy moment. And I said to Galit, I'm happy. So she said, say it, express it, verbalize it. So I said to Lila, we were making chocolate balls, like, Lila, I am happy right now. And suddenly I had this moment of joy, of tears. And I said to Lila, I'm happy. These are tears of joy. And I know this sounds maybe very, I don't know, a simple exercise, but for me, this is huge. For men to start speaking their feelings is huge. And once they learn how to speak, and they, they act out less and they verbalize more, we help them to self-regulate through communication. So instead of either shutting down or walking out, to stay close, to stay in relationship, to say it, and to say something and then just stay open. Because some men will say something and then they'll do a little jab or a joke. They'll smoke screen their little vulnerable moment. So what I try to help men do and women to stay in that state, in that crucible, as David Schnarch talks about, is to let them say it and then stay open. And the ability to stay in the crucible, I'll say a couple of words about that. So David Schnarch, who is a couple, who just passed away a couple of months ago, he was a sex therapist and a couple therapist, and he developed this differentiation-based paradigm. And the essence of it, he called, the metaphor is the crucible, a relationship or marriage is a crucible, is a hot place that you melt and reborn into. And actually, I'm happy to do a webinar about differentiation. It's a fascinating um, theory and, and a framework for therapy, but we'll talk about them in a different talk. But the idea for men to stay in the crucible, to not dumb themselves down, not to go grandiose above, to stay in eye level with their partner, with their children, with their siblings, with their parents, with me. A lot of times what I will have to do, I will have to one down myself and say to him, you're smarter than me. You got this. 
I got, I know you're better. I'll have to playfully one down myself. So they will allow me to come closer to them. So it does not become a battle of who's stronger. And the way I do that is I go, I do one down and I add a lot of play. Play is the lubricant of life. Play is the lubricant of therapy. Um, that's connected to the PhD. And I'm happy to talk about it in different in a different talk, but what I do want to say about play, play is softening my perception of myself and softening my perception of reality. And the way I get men to kind of get in touch with themselves is I add a lot of, I spritz a lot of play into the clinic. I spritz a lot of play on myself. I model that I don't take myself too seriously. I'm not afraid to say what's happening right now, whether it's I'm, I'm embarrassed, I don't know what to say. So I'm modeling to them that I'm actually speaking my feelings right now. And what I've noticed is, is the more I'm able to do that, the more they feel they feel less threatened. So they don't have to one-up me or shut me down. They're allowing me to interact with them a little bit more. And the other thing I need to do in order to stay in the crucible is I need to give them more credit than their wives give them. Because a lot of times I call this the intimacy queen and the emotionally handicapped partner. So the intimacy queen, usually it's the it's the wife, it's the female. She's like, oh, he, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't feel anything. He's a rock underneath. He has no idea what I'm feeling. And it's clear to me that he does. So from the onset, I do not treat him as emotionally handicapped. I will constantly be asking him, be conferring with him, consulting with him. And what I've noticed is as I give him more credit, he will step into that role. He will slowly step out of the emotionally handicapped role into a man that has more feelings, who's aware of things. And by the way, the wife doesn't always like that process. In fact, some women will stop therapy the second their man actually wakes up and steps out of the four to six because then the bar is raised and, and it requires her to be more in intimacy. And that connects to owning your shit. Own your shit is a concept that is one of the pillars of my approach, which is basically owning the shadow parts. So the concept of the Jungian shadow, all those traits and parts that I don't like in myself that I either repress or I deny or I project that into others. So it can be anything from my aggressive, my aggressiveness, my horniness, my, my jealousy, but it calls me my vulnerability, my neediness. So a lot of this is helping men see their shadow, owning it, bring it to the front, because as we know, the shadow is where we have our superpowers. So I try to work with every partner and help them block their exits and help them own their shit by bringing them, being playful there, by owning my shit, and then helping them bring that forward. And then once they have their shadows and they can play with this and they can joke a little bit about their covert depression, joke about their defense mechanism, joke about the fact that they're four to sixers, joke about their them blinding themselves, right? Because it's not like this, it's more of a playful thing. Then what they can slowly stay longer and longer in this crucible and more and more sides of them are going to come out. And the last one is trauma release, is working with the wounded, adaptive, and harsh child. Um, so Terry, real, I mean, Different modalities do in different places. It could be psychodrama, it could be EFT, it can be NLP, it can be any you know psychoanalytic work, psychotherapy work. But basically, he does a lot of um, empty chair with the adaptive child. So actually externalizing it and then communicating with it. He does um, cer ceremonies where you write a letter of thank you to the adaptive child. It's been my experience since I come more from the world of improv and psychodrama. So I will do a lot of, of empty chair work. But I'll show an example where we did some writing as well. But it, it's basically kind of zooming out and seeing the intergenerational link. Um, and for a lot of men, talking about their fathers is not simple. What I have noticed, though, is ever since I have done, I've been doing family therapy with my parents, I have been more successful in convincing my clients to bring in their parents, right? Because as you know, we are the weakest link of our therapy. So I've noticed that by sharing my what I'm doing in my process, I've actually managed to tempt men and women, but we're talking today about men, to kind of go back to their fathers, talk about talk to their fathers. And I've been very privileged to do um, father-son sessions um, online and in person, even though they weren't very long, but they were always very powerful, especially as the son is reflecting on his role as a father and what is being passed down or not passed down to his children. And there's this release for emotional and psychological intergenerational scripts. That's another concept, which there's a video on, which is basically the scripts we inherit from our parents that are being passed down from generation to generation. I'm either acting them out or I'm doing a corrective script. I'm trying to do the opposite. So in both of those cases, I'm basically enacting a drama that's older than me. So what I'm actually trying to say is part of 
seeing that, owning it, and then we can move away from either correcting it, which would mean doing the opposite, but which leads to the same results, or replicating it to go to an improvised script, to go do something different. But in order for people to do something different, they first need to realize there is a script, and then to realize that their adaptive child isn't protecting them from this pain. And they need to externalize the adaptive child and let the child calm down a little bit so the functioning adult can come. It's releasing the boy and, and finding the man again. And we can talk about that in, in different aspects. And strengthening the internal functioning adult to not react, react less and less as a boy or as the harsh child, as the aggressive or the cynical or the emotionally handicapped and find a more functioning, more full, more rich, more connected, more present functioning. Trauma release, anybody wanna ask something about that? Okay, well, I just wanna say one thing about that. I have noticed that for me, stage three and two are connected. Like the trauma release will be connected to a relational maturity because a lot of what I like to do, the privilege of doing couples therapy, when you're at, Okay, I'll just say this. In differentiation-based couples therapy, the analysis is systemic, but the intervention is individual. So in fact, I will do individual work with the man in the presence of his wife. Okay, so we're also getting this feedback, but she's also witness to his process. So some of the trauma release is actually relational work because what is relational maturity? What is intimacy? It's into me see, letting someone see into myself. So by him doing this work next to her, He's also experiencing how it is to be vulnerable, how it is to show different sides of himself to her, perhaps for the first time. Just the other day, by the way, I was working with, with a Haredi couple. The wife didn't even know what the, the husband was, was doing. She didn't even know what his job was. That's how, that's how like disconnected and apropos not talk, I have a toothache for half the year. That's how far they were. But of course, she's not going to be interested because when you're a four to six, you're not interesting. So of course the wife isn't fascinated, interesting, and curious about him. He's not, no one's curious about him. In fact, a lot of the times these COVID depressed men are just not relevant in the, in the family. I remember one father telling me, I asked for milk. No one ever buys the milk I like. Why? Because you're not relevant. Why? Because you're a four to six or why? Like, so they actually, they're feeling the, 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 the taxes for this, but oftentimes they're so used to it. They don't know anything else. That they can't even imagine a different reality. Yes, somebody raised their hand and I want to address that. Yes, it's Hannah Valeria. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, there were two things I wanna, I wanna comment with second a question. I, um, it's interesting, I'm, I specialize, one of the things I specialize in trauma and it's interesting, I, I find this, I, I guess you kind of alluded to the fact that it's not so, you know, it's not so linear, but I find working with the trauma really impacts the emotional maturity and impacts most, some of the things you talk about in terms of emotional maturity. So I feel like, I suppose I sometimes find that I'm working with those elements and, and working with the trauma, it becomes kind of a, you know that impacts stage two rather than you know yes the way. I, I, I think it's a great point it also it's really interesting because what is your client coming in with does you know does the client say i want to work on my trauma that's great. no but i think you're right but that, i think it's also my job my responsibility to kind of it to do some psycho ed around that and explain how some of this work yeah. and what trauma does to relationships and to individual functioning and, and, and psychological and you know, all this other stuff that you're talking about um so that's thank you um so the second uh, qu a question I have is this. It's really interesting when you're talking about when you're talking about doing individual work in the presence of the wife, as opposed to doing, is this different? I mean, it sounds like you're positioning it differently to couple work. And if you do, can you explain the difference and why you would choose that over doing, do you know what I mean? So this, this taps into differ the differentiation based paradigm the crucible approach developed by David Schnars. Um, but I'll say my take on this, okay? Right. The differenti differentiation-based couples therapy is different than attachment-based couple therapy in the sense that it is actually focusing much more on the functioning adult and less on the wounded child. And they're basically the idea is that relationships are crucible and therapy is a crucible. And my job is to block exits and raise the temperature. And instead of um, encouraging the wife to validate her husband's like, like an imago interchange, right? I want him to self-confront himself and validate himself in her presence. So it's about helping you grow next to your partner and you keep working with him until she feels uncomfortable and then I go over her. And I, I say it's a two for one. 
you get to work on yourself. And at the same time, you get to find out whether your wife or your partner can grow with you. Because here's another truism that's a kind of a, a, a real a presupposition I have. And here I'm quoting Estelle Perel, the wonderful legendary couple of therapist who says, we will all marry more than once. The question is, will we be with the same person? And right. I realized I help, I help couples remarry. I help couples mm-hmm. remarry. And the way I do that, I say, come work with your partner. That's the best way to find out whether you have another marriage with this woman. Can you show these vulnerable sides and can she grow with you? Because what happens is when I see him alone, when I see her alone, um, then oftentimes we will, have, we will share this amazing intimate inter- interaction and we will cry together and laugh together. I call this the clinical affair. Right, so we'll have this clinical affair, but it won't necessarily help her with her covertly depressed husband, because it's just going to accentuate the differences between me and her husband, or me and his mm-hmm. wife. Mm-hmm. And then there's a much bigger chance of a coalition, and then we're kind of demonizing the partner. And as much as I can talk amazing about you have a great husband, he's amazing. Oftentimes, in her mind, she'll be like, "Well, he doesn't laugh with me. He doesn't cry with me. He doesn't, you know." I have never told him what I told you because he would never understand that. I'm like, really? Let's find that out. So oftentimes I try as, as much as I can to convince people to come with their partner, but it's, it's actually really challenging because a lot of people don't want to do this work next to their partner. Right. Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, I would say some of the goals in terms of what I work with, when I work with couples, I would agree with similar to what you're saying. Um, I suppose I frame it much more as a couple therapy or and sometimes I work with people individually to bring them together into the couple. But I guess it's yeah. more of a traditional kind of relational approach. Um, uh, and, you know, with all kinds of things going on there, not only validation, of course, but yeah. OK, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different kind of frame around it. I want to say, um, and this is important, it took me many years to find what works for me. Um, being a male in a in the psychotherapy profession, I've been an extroverted man who takes up a lot of space, who's blunt, who's not very introverted, who, who just speaks, blurts things out. It took me many, many years to try to be someone I'm not. Apropos what Shalom Sak talked about, about me being vulnerable. And I think finding this specific approach was what fit me, fit the way I work, fit the way I am, fit the way I want to be. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm not saying everyone should work like this. I'm saying this is what works for me. Oh, sure. With my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to Any understand what was your thinking around it. It's very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for clarifying. Sure. Anybody else want to ask something before we move on? All right. So we have sobriety, relational maturity, trauma release. Let's keep going. Relational heroism, which is another concept um, Terriel talks about. So it's the man who's willing to step into the crucible to be face to face. It's healing the dichotomy between the masculine and the feminine. When every cell in your body wants to go to the old pattern and you just persevere through it. And I want to give an example on myself. Um, when Galit used to say things about me that were critical, I used to either lash out, shut down, block it. And I have learned through blood, sweat, and tears, she'll actually give me a heads up. She's going to say, I'm going to say something that's going to be critical. And I literally sit down, put my hands either on the bed or on the chair, and I breathe. And I feel this, this pull that I want to go to the old patterns and I have to rewire my brain to sit there and let that burn. And I have in my clinic, I'll show you guys. Can anybody guess what this is? You want to see this? Yes. Anybody want to guess what this is? Okay. Okay, you guys are very interactive. Wasabi, this is, I, wasabi uh, is that wasabi peas. balls? Wasabi yeah. peas, exactly. Wasabi Why do I have wasabi peas in my clinic? Because I want them to feel it burn. So when the wife says something harsh, they can just eat it and let it burn through their chest. They can feel it. And I'm like, yeah, that's how it feels. We call that letting it land in improv. Letting it land inside. Ah. And the relational here is the man that wants to be a better father than their father. I want to cut the chain of abuse that they've inherited or neglect or four to six. And these are, these are men that are willing to serve others, step out of their own narcissism and be of service to other people. Those are relational heroes. And I think 
uh, I chose this picture of me with the kids and my brother-in-law's wedding because there was just a moment there, a rare moment for me of just peace and happiness. And I just felt good. I just felt like I'm with my kids. I'm not just working all the time. And I think that is for me a struggle. It's not a thing you achieve. It's a thing I aim. And part of keeping myself accountable is doing talks like this and sharing my own shadow and my own shit and how I'm trying to stay a hero so I can model to both my son and my daughter a different type of uh, masculinity. Again, I use the white word in every single session. So complete the following statements. You can also just do this verbally. So feelings are, I'll just ask them that feelings are. And if we had more time, I would just ask you to write. Well, you're all therapists. So, I mean, it'll be, but lay people, when you ask them feelings are, a lot of times men, if, you, if, you, if you're playful enough, they'll give you the, it's a burden or your pain is, or my, my wife's pain. When she speaks out, what happens to you? What are you thinking? Yeah, I need to fix it. Okay. Or crying is, and you'll notice completing the statements is basically a prompt to fl flesh out the core belief. And then I write it on the board and then it's there. And then what I've noticed, and I also share this, is also, there's a video also on core beliefs, by the way. Um, you will marry somebody with similar or complementary core beliefs. So if you have a core belief, let, let's say the core belief I see all the time, your pain is my responsibility. Because that's the symbiotic fantasy. That's what we read in books and we see in Hollywood movies, right? If I have that core belief, I will marry someone who has a similar core belief or else it'll never work out. Because I'm reminding you in systemic therapy, uh, relationship is a pattern. I can only build a pattern with somebody who sees the world in a complementary or similar way. So when I write your, 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 your pain is my responsibility, I'm actually talking to both of them. And once we see that, we can start talking about that. We can start being playful about that. Where did you learn that? Is that true? Are there, what's the tax you pay for that? We're slowly externalizing that core belief. And what I've noticed, another thing we do in couple therapy, we, I, I try to always balance the field. The first thing I need to balance is that she's not the intimacy queen and he's not emotionally handicapped. Because the second we balance that out, we can start working. Because as long as she thinks that she's superior to him or he's superior to her, it's going to be very hard to move. And it gets worse when you're working with a female therapist and her partner, which I'm getting more and more rec recently. And it's, it's, it's tough because in her mind, she knows. She knows him better than he knows himself. And he's happy to cooperate with that because his secondary gains is that he doesn't have to deal with it. So he'll blind himself because he has other secondary gains. Secondary gains is connected to shadow. And that's there's actually a video on owning your shit. Why you should own your shit. Um, when did you stop crying as a boy? Where did you learn that you need to be strong, that vulnerability is dangerous? When did you cry lately? Do you cry? Who do you shave your, pair, your pain with? Who do you talk to? This is a fascinating question because most men, their answer will be no one. And, and if they do share, they'll either share it with their wife, but then what happens is what happens when my wife is upset with me or when she's bitter at me or when she has full of contempt, I have no one to talk to. Because with my friends, I'm not going to talk to them about the problems with my marriage. Mm, I don't want to be a wimp. So they're left with all this. They're just cooking all this inside. And they have no one to talk to. And then they have to act it out. So even just sharing, even saying no one next to your wife already impacts the system. Because she's like, oh, wow, he has pain. Because the biggest tax the four to six years pay is that their pain is not considered serious. Oh, it's hard for you to work. Huh? have your own car, it's hard, tears, you know? They're being mocked because their pain is like, you feel no pain, you're a four to six, you don't care about anything. You know, look at your shirt, you don't even know where you're trying, you know? Their, their pain is mocked, so no one's even listening to them. But they're, they're, they're so, they internalize that so much, they're already used to it, so there's, there's no point sharing my pain. Or this Kareni Kaval, he's like, every time I share my pain, my wife outvictims me, and it goes about, it becomes her about her pain. I call that the victim competition. That's another video you can check out. How do you run away from your pain? So how do you how do you numb yourself? How do you numb yourself? I will actually say, how do you run away from this? So your wife, as we can see, is full of contempt for you. She doesn't respect you. She doesn't see you. She doesn't listen to you. She's not, she's not curious about you. How do you numb yourself for that? How do you run away from that? I will actually ask them that. And actually, they will answer. I don't care. Well, I'm on my phone, my friends, porn, but they're going to answer me. Do you want to stop away? Do you want to stop running away? You're interested in that? No. Usually they'll say no. Why should I? And then I have to show them what they're losing. Their secondary losses, actually. But it can help you meet yourself. 
do you want to feel more? Do you want to step out of the four to six? I've noticed the four to six is such a simple metaphor. It really works for a lot of people. Um, it's not in the handout, but now that I think about it, I will try to find a way to send you some of these links to these videos. I call it, what's your emotional range? Four to six is survival mindset. I'm in survival mode. Three to seven, two to nine, that's really living. So are you surviving or are you living? Do you want to live? And are you willing to risk to feel more? Because when you drop efficiency, when you step into the over depression, you will not get applause because you are disrupting the homeostasis of the system. So are you willing to take that chance? Working less, making less money, I don't know, being mocked. Are you willing to risk that? And by the way, I wanted to say that um, sometimes these men go through a change and the wife doesn't like it and she leaves. She'll say, this is not the man I married. So she was complaining about it being a four to sixer, but now that he's more sensitive, I'll give a, just one example. I remember from years ago, classic four to sixer, also on the spectrum, I think. Erectile dysfunction as well. We cleaned up everything. He finally reaches the stage where he's like, I want to go to the doctor and I want to get Viagra to get our sex life back. And then she says, no need. We'll stop therapy here. She didn't want to take the next level and, and re-enter sexual intimacy. So as just an example, that sometimes these men actually wanted the shift, but their systems are not necessarily that supportive of that. Because I'm reminding you, I married you as a four to sixer and you're still changing on me. And I don't want to change myself because we are all creatures of habit. And I think that it's clear to me that if I did not choose to be a therapist, I wouldn't be a four to sixer. That's my default. I was not a one to ten. I mean, I'm not a one to tenner. Like it, it is effort for me to step out of the four to six. It's clear to me that I chose therapy because I wanted to somehow unconsciously enlarge in my own range. But if I look at my dad and my grandfather and look at that line, it's clear to me, you know, I was, I'm, I'm a third generation four to sixer. Okay. So oftentimes, so when somebody will say that to me, A, I'll respect it, but B, I'll say, well, are you alive now? Would you rather be blown up in a minefield or just be casually dead, stoic, no beat, you know? But at the end of the day, you know, I can't want this more than my clients. And I say that to them. I, will say, I say, I will not work harder than you will in this therapy. That's why I stopped doing, by the way, weekly sessions. The clients decide when they're coming in next because I want them to take ownership of the process. Well, that's a different time. All right, one more slide. Other interventions. And this is a great quote by Terry Rio. Boys don't need their father's balls. They need their hearts. And I remind myself in those moments that I realize my son is not scared of me. I see that for some reason as a sign of weakness, but then I'm like, I don't want my son to be scared of me. I want him to know my heart. Not on good days. On bad days, I berate myself for not, for not having enough authority, but that's a different talk. So here's other interventions. Um, feel free. Try to widen your emotional range, both of the positive and negative, whether it's chocolate balls making with your daughter, or whether it's when you're exhausted, sharing that. Express your feelings, write, move, sing, yell, talk, sing. I, I suddenly realized I've sing twice and I realized my dad who formed the first barbershop quartet in the Middle East always said, if you're too busy to sing, you're too busy. And perhaps now that I'm broadcasting live and this is a stream of consciousness, I realize that when my dad sings, his range doubles. So if at home he's more of an introvert, a four to six year on stage, you will see him cry and laugh and be on a high. And I think that maybe perhaps that's why I wrote Sing Twice. And that's why when my friends would come over, they were always surprised because at home he's, such a, he's so much narrower. Like it's clear to me, like Galit always says to me, my wife, I wish I was one of your clients because I hear you through the door laughing and crying and there's such more of a range than at home. So try to express your feeling more. Celebrate personal milestones and rituals. Bring back some play into your life. I'm happy to do a workshop just about play because it's so important. Bringing back playfulness. That's the first thing I need to do with these men. I need to flirt with them. I need to joke with them. I need to go a little bit rude with them, a little bit blunt with them. Just to, just to celebrate these little things. Like the happy dance. Do a happy dance. I don't know. Um, join the men's circle, join group, join therapy, hear yourself and other men and know that you are not alone. I think a lot of this, the power that I, what I've learned to harness my, being a man myself is I just tell them these stories about myself and about other men. I'm like, ah, it's not just me because we are losing the, the tribe. I mean, I mean, Iron John, Robert Playa talks about we've lost the, the initiation of older men. 
Older men are not initiating younger men. So there's no wisdom being passed down. There's no collective wisdom of men. And it's really finding this new wave of, of, of men. So find those people. Touch and talk to your partner. Touch. For so many men, nobody touches them. And they don't touch anyone unless you're having sex. And there's just, just touching them. And oftentimes when I'll do a double with a man, I will put my hand on his shoulders and I will hold him. And I'll grab his shoulders, I'll just, just to touch him a little bit, just to shake him up a little bit. And so, I, and I will obviously ask permission, right? And I'll just notice through my hand, like, ah, oh, no one's touching these men. No one's touching them. Touch your partner, or talk to them, date night, workshops, couples therapy. Hug and prioritize your kids. Tell them about your childhood. Tell them about your fears. Tell them about your difficulties. Tell them how you persevered or not. I think this is super important. So many men are like, why should I tell my kids about my fears? Why? Because you want to normalize that because you want to let them know that it's okay to talk about their fears so they don't go to four to six so they can stay a bit wider so they can recognize when you're upset so they know when I have nothing to give, he knows that I can own it. He knows that's okay. And also about your, 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 your fears and also your good moments. Share that as well. I'm so happy. I'm so happy right now making these chocolate balls. I'm so happy that Saba and Safta are coming over. I'm so happy. If your father or your parents are alive, communicate verbally, vulnerably, curious, curiously with them. I always try to convince my clients, if not to do a session with me with their parents, go talk to your parents, go do open up some of that stuff. Because once they die, it's locked in and, and these intergenerational scripts are much harder to change. And I remind them that the fact going to do work with your parents is not in order to change them. It's in order to change yourself by going back to the factory where you were made, confronting certain core beliefs, asking them about that. And I can just um, attest from my personal experience working with my parents for over a year now. It hasn't revolutionized and changed who I was, but so many patterns I've noticed. I've learned so much about myself. It's really impacted my, my, my parenting. And, and it's really changed my relationship with them, allowing a much wider range with both of them. With me, with both of them, and them with me. And maybe them with themselves. And obviously read, I Don't Want to Talk About It by Terrence Rio and his other books, because I think it's great. And I'm going to pause here and ask for questions, comments, thoughts. And I'll just say, so we had this tradition. I just want to say one thing. You'll see, my, so my dad, and, we started with the picture of my dad and me, and then Tzach, and then that's Lila in the front. And we kind of, the thing I like about this picture, it's, up, it's about masculinity, but it's, we're bringing in Lila into this. We're, we're softening this. We're bringing this intergenerational thing. We're adding some play. And you'll see her face, and I think it's charming. Yeah, question. So I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I will leave links in the description where you can purchase the book. I highly recommend reading that book. And I wish all of us to feel free to feel the whole emotional range and to step out of our covert depression into life. My name is Dr. Sir Romanelli, and this is The Potential State. I'll see you next time.